Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 240, featuring the fourth and final, I'm sad to say, installment of my interview with Mr. Julian Gollop, the creator of XCOM. In this part of the interview, we talk about a lot of topics. Uh, we talk about some of the uh, lesser-known XCOM titles, including uh, XCOM Apocalypse, and uh, some titles that were canceled. Uh, we also talk about his uh, Shadow Wars game for the 3DS and much, much more. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Julian Gollop. And so I guess when you when they were working, so it was a different team working on Terra from the Deep, right? Yeah. So were you working on uh, Apocalypse at this time? Yes. So or I guess Terra... what would become Apocalypse? Yeah, so Terra from the Deep and XCOM Apocalypse were more or less started at the same time, actually, yes. So I got a little quotation here that you you had said back then. I don't know when this went on. <laughs> anyway, I have a quotation from you about this game. Sure. I thought I would see what you think about it now. Uh, go on then. <laughs> okay, so you said we didn't really want to do another XCOM game because after three years working on the game, we wanted to do something different, which was, of course, very silly of us because we should have capitalized on what we had. Yes. So you would agree with that today? Yes. I'm afraid so, yes. So what did you not like about the way Apocalypse turned out? Um, it was too complicated, difficult development, um, the theme and setting not so attractive really as the original one. Um, interface was pretty clunky. I mean, the decision to make the the um, battles real time actually you could choose to be real time or turn based, hmm. um, but that was a bit of a headache. Yeah, I it think sounds like a really <laughs> massive undertaking to have both options just from a design. Yes, perspective. exactly. Yeah, so both options and. It was, uh, I mean, it worked. I, th I think the game is pretty good and pretty interesting. If you can get into it, it's, I'm quite, you know, proud of it, really. But I, it was a very difficult development for us, and it didn't go very smoothly. And we should have continued to involve the original system somehow, I think. So I saw that some of this game was based on a ju Judge Dredd concept uh, well the idea of out. having a huge city um, set in the future which was kind of a little bit lawless ruled by <laughs> these judges in this case ruled by XCOM or nobody actually in fact in, in XCOM Apocalypse you had a police force and they were basically just one of the many factions that were inside the city and you had religious factions and criminal syndicates and you had corporations that produced weapons and the vehicles and these these were all factions that could have relationships with each other um, and there's kind of an element of diplomacy in there which is pretty cool. Are you a fan of the Judge Dredd novels? Oh yeah, well I, I was following Judge Dredd from the beginning when it was first published in 2000 and AD um, back in 1978 I think I remember the first I've got my, my first copies of 2000 AD go back to then, so yeah, Judge Dredd was one of my favorite comic uh, strips. Did you see the Stallone movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not so good. Actually, there, there's been a more recent Judge Dredd movie, which was a bit better, but nothing like the original comic. Yeah, so just to finish up here, I want to talk a little bit about some of these, just briefly about some of these later games. You'd already mentioned this one, Magic and Mayhem. Yeah. I guess that was 1998. Yeah. So I saw a quote that you had said about that game, and I wasn't, I wonder if you could sort of flesh this out a little bit, because I wasn't quite sure what you meant here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you said it would have been easier if Baldur's Gate had come out before, or come out earlier. Oh, because we wanted to um, build more RPG elements into the game. And uh, Virgin Interactive told us, well, no, you've got to just focus on the RTS elements because uh, RPG games don't sell. And this was their firm directive. You know, RPG games don't sell, don't go in that direction. Um, but of course, there was a huge vacuum in the market for decent RPG games. So as soon as Baldur's Gate came along, it was just enormous. So... <laughs> I think the game may have gone a slightly different direction if we, um, if Baldur's Gate had proved the point that uh, there are is in fact substantial demand for good quality computer RPG games. 
I've had a couple of people asking about this Dreamland Chronicles and Freedom Ridge project. Yeah. And so that sounds like it was uh, an XCOM style game. Yeah. Yeah. So what what was going on? Yeah. Why, why was that canceled? Yeah. Well, this was our second game for Virgin Interactive, and we worked on it for a year, and we had a sort of working demo on the PC where you had can select soldiers and move them around, a little tactical battle demo. We had a working Geoscape version. We were also developing it on the PlayStation 2, which is why it had a more sort of console-friendly control scheme. And the problem was that Virgin Interactive effectively went bust and they sold all their assets to, uh, well, first to Interplay, and then Interplay sold to another company called Titus Interactive. And Titus Interactive were not interested in our game. They were only interested in Interplay's assets in the IP, you know, um, Fallout, for example. So they um, cancelled our project. And... Um, because we had a four game deal with Virgin Interactive, we couldn't actually approach any other publisher. And we had to liquidate our company. Hmm. So, what happened to this, the code and the assets for this? Are they just in limbo? Or is there... No, the code and the assets were given to uh, another company called Alta Interactive, and they made a game called UFO Extraterrestrials, which. Um, wasn't really the game that we were developing. They changed the combat system, they changed the story quite a bit, so they changed a lot of stuff. Um, but nonetheless, that's what happened to Dreamland Chronicles. Well, somebody said there was a game called Valkyrie Chronicles that seemed a little suspiciously similar. Yeah, so, yeah, for anybody who's played Valkyrie Chronicles, when I first played it, I thought, wow, this is very much like our uh, demo version of uh, Dreamland Chronicles that we had because it had the same sort of control scheme for your soldiers, same similar, very similar firing scheme, and then we had this idea with an action point bar going down as you moved your character. So that was uh, nice that it came along because I guess it proved our original concept, um, even though Dreamland itself wasn't released. You think it's just basically a coincidence? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about Rebel Star Tactical Command and Laser Squad Nemesis? Well, Laser Squad Nemesis was a an online multiplayer game only, two player tactical game. It had a, a phased real time system. So this is like uh, an interesting um, way to have real time action, but in an, in a structured turn based way. So. You gave orders to your soldiers for the next ten next ten seconds of action, and then you sent your orders off to a central server. They got processed. You got your results back, and then you look at see what happened. And you could view this like a with a little uh, video style controls. You can pause, rewind, and you could see the action unfold. And um, it was just very cool. Really, really good game. Uh, but it was multiplayer only. Um, we did add a single player a bit later on, but um, it was released in 2002, and again, it was just sold directly by our little company, myself and Nick and one other friend were working on it, um, and we sold it directly over the internet. So can people uh, still buy this today, or is it gone? No, no, and our, the servers are not working anymore. Then after that, we made Rebel Star Tactical Command, which was... Um, a game for the Game Boy Advance, and this we went back to the turn-based tactical system that was basically in Laser Squad, so it's probably most similar to Laser Squad actually. Um, but we've got a different story, uh, a, se a much longer sequence of missions, uh, the overarching story, and a little RPG leveling up system for your characters. Um, and it was pretty cool because we managed to get this working on a GBA which has very limited memory. Uh, and we still had all the elements of the original laser squad, like you know, destructible terrain, line of sight systems, you know, smoke, gas, and fire effects, and um, lots of different weapons and equipment that you could use. So it was uh, a nice little game. It's been pretty radical change going from designing for computers to the Game Boy Advance. 
Yeah, I know, but I, I love the Game Boy Advance. I, I've actually bought all of Nintendo's handheld games machines since the original Game Boy, and uh, even now I've got a 3DS, so <laughs> still yeah, playing. Just about to say the 3DS, you actually had a launch title for that. Yes, so that is, um, is yeah, Ghost Recon Shadows. Sorry? So that must have been a real uh, opportunity or an honor. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic because actually we, we were originally developing Ghost Recon Shadow Wars for the Nintendo DS because our studio in Sofia was, um, I was working for Ubisoft here in Sofia and we were only doing handheld stuff at the time and I pitched this game um, as Ghost Recon meets XCOM on the Nintendo DS and that's how it started. Well, if that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Once the 3DS was announced, we, we switched to being developing on the 3DS, um, and it was intended to be a launch title on the 3DS, which it was. In fact, it was the second highest rated launch title on the 3DS out of 17 or 18 or so launch titles. Um, and it's a very cool, again, tactical system. It's, um, it's more of a sort of cross-evolution of my original systems, and say something like um, Advance Wars. So it retains like a, a much more console-friendly interface, but it still has some great two-player tactical gameplay in it. And um, I really liked it. I thought it was a cool game. I like you're a real fan of the of the Nintendo handhelds. Yes, they, have, they seem to still be the sort of the king of the the handhelds. Yes, um, 3DS might be the last one. I don't know. I was amazed about this. Uh, maybe you can shed some light on this. So they they have you designing a launch title for this thing, and you didn't know it would have 3D technology no, or 3D screens? No, we had no idea. In fact, we, we didn't get the development kits we, until fairly late into development. We, were, we basically switched to developing it on the PC, and we had some technical specifications, so we knew the size of the two s screen displays, for example. Um, and we thought it was very weird that the top display was actually larger than the bottom display, even though the bottom display was supposed to be the touchscreen display. And originally, we had the main action taking place on the touchscreen display because we could use a stylus to play the game, and we just had information display on the top. Um, but when they revealed that the top display was in fact a 3D display, we, we suddenly realized what they were thinking and we actually had to switch around our screens so that the main action was taking place in the top 3D display and the bottom screen became our informational readout display. So um, that's how, how that happened and we we struggled to, to get it ready for launch because Nintendo's dev kit was still very underdeveloped and their SDK, they kept updating the SDK right up to launch. And it was um, it was a close call, basically. It seems strange that you wouldn't, and they would take so long to let you in on that. Yeah. Just, it's, what was going on? Wanted to keep it secret. They really want to keep that. That you know, that was, that was their big sort of um, unique selling point was the fact that they got this 3D screen. So you said you think the 3DS is their last handheld? Well, I mean, it might not be. It might be the last handheld, um, dedicated handheld console ever, <laughs> because it's basically nowadays mobile phones are, you know, going to be better than any console that any developer could probably make, I think. Well, Julian, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. I know it's kind of late on your end. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Uh, I am kind of wondering what your future projects might look like. Well, I don't have a huge amount to announce at the moment, but I can tell you that my next project um, will be an XCOM-style game in that it will have turn-based tactical missions. It will have something like a G-Escape, and it will have a story which involves some kind of aliens. But more than that, I cannot tell you at the moment. <laughs> That's still very exciting. Really looking forward to it. And Thanks Great. again for taking the, the time to chat with me. Well, thank you, Matt.
that's all for this week's episode. Whew, hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week, uh, probably with a review of a game called Stellaris. Stellaris? Maybe I should learn how to pronounce it uh, before I do the review of it. Um, anyway, I've been having a lot of fun with it, so I think I'll uh, look at that next. But uh, Anyway, if you have ideas for future episodes or guests you'd like to see on the program, just let me know. Uh, i got some people lining up, but uh, you know I'm always uh, open to suggestions, so I thank you very much for those. Uh, especially if you happen to know how I can contact the people. Uh, that's especially helpful. If you really want to see a guest on the show, then help me get in touch with them. Uh, they'll be much more likely to appear than if you just give me the name. You know, sorry. All right. Uh, anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for watching this program as well as supporting it via Patreon or PayPal. Uh, if you want to do your part to keep these episodes coming, uh, please do one of the following. Either go to the Patreon site, become a subscriber for a buck an episode. Uh, you can go to my uh, mattchat.us site and um, just make a one-time donation, but just, just don't forget to uh, do that again uh, if it's been a while. Uh, or thirdly, just uh, let other people know about the program. Uh, tell them about it on Facebook or 4chan, uh, wherever you guys are hanging out. Uh, believe it or not, not many people know about this program and all these uh, guests that we have on here. So uh, help me spread the word, and I will appreciate it very, very much. So thank you to each and every one of you who has supported the show, however you have done so. Thank you. Uh, before I get to the news, I have a, I guess you'd call this a correction. This is by Pedro. I sent in to, uh, from Pedro on a comment on the last video. He says, uh, Matt, Rebel Star Raiders, uh, created before Chaos, and Rebel Star... After Chaos are two different games, though obviously based on the same ideas. Uh, the one shown in the video is always Rebel Star Raiders, with the small character graphics and the entire map on screen. Rebel Star was a much more complex game with larger graphics, a much bigger scrolling map, a uh, one-player option, and so on. Basically a less advanced laser squad. Uh, the video and title implies that they're just a single game. Uh, Rebel Star had graphics like Rebel Star 2. They actually used the same engine, unlike Rebel Star Raiders, which I think was at least partially programmed in BASIC. Uh, so I, I was aware of this, but it might have got confused. I might have gotten confused in the making of the video or during the interview or whatever. So uh, anyway, just to clear this up, I'll put screenshots here of the Rebel Star Raiders and then Rebel Star. And so hopefully that will clear that up. And thank you for uh, sending that in, Pedro. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Oh man, a ton of news here. I had so much news I had to cut some out, so uh, I'll just put the, I think the most important bits here, the most fun anyway. Uh, the first one was David Arsula, a good friend of mine. He said he uh, posted about Mini Doom, Mini Doom, a very short parody game based on the classic game Doom One. Uh, this is Calavera Studio. Uh, they say they created it as part of a game programming course uh, we gave over here. Not sure where here is <laughs> to show how to make a simple platformer on Game Maker Studio. Uh, you can play it at Newsgrounds. And uh, you can play it in the browser. You don't have to download anything. So I thought that was fun. Always like to post the Doom stuff. Good to see that game. Still getting uh, <laughs> love. Uh, and then Stig sent in a couple items. Uh, the first is uh, an update on a game called Mass Effect Andromeda. And this update was posted by one Aaron Flynn, the general manager of BioWare. Uh, wouldn't you like to have that power? Uh, let's see. So this new game, I tried to uh, cut out the marketing hype. It's supposed to have more freedom. Uh, so I know that was a big complaint about a certain other Mass Effect game. Uh, new Uncharted Worlds. We're leaving the Milky Way behind and headed to Andromeda, where we'll meet new allies, confront new enemies, and explore fascinating new worlds. To boldly go where... I think that's another, another series. Uh, let's see. Uh, the first Mass Effect game for today's consoles. Boo. Wish they would do one for PC. Uh, but anyway, it is what it is, right? And the first built on the Frostbite engine. Frostbite engine. What are all these? My, you know, when you live in Minnesota, you don't like anything that reminds you of Frostbite. Uh, we're pushing the technology to deliver visual story and gameplay that had never been done in franchise history. We're pushing the technology to deliver visual story and gameplay that had never been done in franchise. I assume they mean their own uh, Mass Effect uh, franchise history. 
Anyway, I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of uh, other details on that game, but I, I really enjoyed all the Mass Effect games, even the, uh, the third one. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see what they come up with on that. Uh, he also sent in this. So this is a little bit more, I guess you'd call this a rumor mill. Well, I don't know what exactly to call it, but uh, anyway, I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> so let me just read you what he wrote. Uh, he says, Beamdog, or Wizards of the Coast, has pulled a rather slimy move recently. Uh, they made sure the classic Baldur's Gate games are unavailable on Steam and GOG unless you buy the enhanced edition versions. Uh, there's an uproar about this on the good old games forum. Uh, so I, I did confirm that there is indeed an uproar, uh, but I'm sure I'm trying to figure out more details about this, you know, to what extent this is, uh, you know, if this has anything to do with the reactions over the uh, Beamdog's uh, Siege of Dragonspear controversy around that, I don't really know. Uh, but anyway, I, I want to know more about the situation. So if you know anything, uh, if you have some kind of insider info, uh, please forward that to me. Okay, then we have some really awesome news, in my opinion anyway. Uh, Civilization VI has been announced. Seems like forever, and I've probably logged, I don't know, probably a thousand something hours into Civ V. Uh, so I don't know how in the world it could be better than that game, but apparently people still like the third and fourth game better. So it seems like every Civ has its uh, fans, right? But anyway, Civ VI is supposed to be out October 21st. And I wasn't able to find, uh, besides uh, the graphics look different, but I really haven't been able to find anything but sort of hype about what would be different about it. They say new ways to interact with your world. You know, what does that mean? Uh, expand your empire across the map, advance your culture. We could do all that before. So I don't, I don't really know what's new about it. Maybe, I hope it's more than just a new, actually, would it be better or worse, you think, if they really revamped it? You know, how, how different do you want your Civ 6 to be than 5 or whatever the previous games? Uh, anyway, I'd just be curious about your opinions on, on that, what you've seen so far, what you'd like to see in a new Civ game. And then finally, and I'm sorry, maybe it's a good thing the news is long, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Adam Dayton sent this in. Uh, this is news by Game Informer, and uh, my... Color ran out, so I cannot make out the name of this author on the article. I remember it being a woman, but anyway, I'll post a link to it in the show notes. Uh, anyway, the, the news is about Night Dive Studios' remake of System Shock will be coming to crowdfunding website Kickstarter on June 29th. While it is titled System Shock Remastered, this is considered a reimagining of the cyberpunk cult classic from a rational looking glass, not to be confused with System Shock Enhanced Edition that launched on GOG last year. System Shock went on to inspire other large franchises, yada yada. Old hat to you guys, I'm sure. Uh, meanwhile, developer Warren Spector is working on the new entry to series, System Shock 3. So all exciting stuff. I'll post a link to that in the show notes. And as always, guys, I really like reading your comments on these news items. You know, sometimes I don't really know what to make of it, so it's very helpful to get the, uh, the feedback from, from you all. All right, what about, the, <laughs> uh, what about that drink of the week? All right, so this week I've got something uh, uh, really unusual. This is a, a tea. You know, uh, Arizona, I don't know if you're familiar with that brand. They've got several different flavors of tea, but this one was really unique, I thought. A lightly sweet, uh, lightly sweet oak brewed tea. So I guess they're taking a page from some of those uh, micro brewed ales that are brewed in the, uh, that they brew in the barrels that they use for bourbons and whatnot. Uh, let's see, this is brewed in American Oak Refined Artisanal Blend, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, let's see, Bre black tea brewed with uh, water, of course, uh, sugar, honey, maple sh sugar. Maple sugar, that's kind of interesting. So I guess instead of uh, high fructose corn syrup or uh, even cane sugar, this is sweetened with uh, honey and maple sugar. So that sounds very interesting. Yeah, sweetened with maple sugar, 100% pure. Anyway, I don't think you're going to get a more interesting looking tea than this, at least not without having to go to China or India or someplace like that. Uh, so let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Arizona Reserve Oak Brewed Tea, and still, I love this uh, bottle they put it in. Very clever uh, design on that. I wonder if they have like a collector's edition that's actually made, put in a, a little wood barrel bottle. That'd be pretty cool. I can definitely smell the, uh, 
the T here, um, a little bit of a, kind of a little bit of a citrusy aroma. Uh, just something else in here. I don't know if, I guess that must be the, the oak. But anyway, you can definitely smell some element here that isn't normal. It doesn't smell like the other Arizona teas out there. So I can't quite tell you what it is. So I guess I'll try to taste it instead. It's definitely lightly sweetened. Uh, the other, like the southern style Arizona tea is what I usually get. And of course, that's very sweet. Uh, this is not really sweet at all. Matter of fact, I don't uh, really, it just tastes like water to me. Let me try it again. Yeah, this is a very uh, mild tea. It's like a, you took a sort of weak, uh, diluted uh, tea, black tea, and just put a little bit of sweetener in there. Just enough to counteract the bitterness. I don't really taste any kind of a wooden flavor. It's not no smoky flavor in this. It's a no <laughs> bourbon flavor, nothing like that. Uh, just kind of tastes like a sort of watery tea. Yeah, I'm not uh, not really impressed with this. I got to say, uh, very weak flavors. I mean, there's a little bit of stuff going on there. Uh, but yeah, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I could brew a tastier tea just with a couple of bags of uh, Lipton in the old uh, water kettle. So I'm going to go one out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, it's a cool concept, cool bottle, I guess marketing. I guess I'm a victim of marketing here. Uh, the actual flavor of the tea, though, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotes about war. I don't know why. I guess I was thinking about that Tom Clancy game. And I found this quotation that I really, really liked by Leo Tolstoy. I'm actually reading his uh, book, one of his books right now, uh, Anna Karenina. And the quote goes something like this. The two most powerful warriors are patience and time. See you guys next week. That man does not look stable.